just need. I think we should be okay at six o'clock now, so. Uh, okay. Well, good evening, everybody. Um, members and people who are viewing this uh, uh, presentation of the uh, uh, Community and Environment Committee. Uh, we have six, said five items on the agenda to discuss, quite interesting ones. Um, can you, can we first of all have the roll call please, Jackie? Yes. Um, Councillor Jones? Yes. Councillor Hayes? 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 Yes.
is the undertaking of a detailed assessment, which is currently being procured. If this indicates that an air quality management area should be declared, then a report will be submitted to committee in relation to that declaration. Thank you, Mr. Dobbs, for pointing out the out of date text on the council's website. This has now been updated. Thank you. Um, the next item is interest. Has anybody any interest to declare? Uh, yeah, account. I have. Yes, and I have as well on uh, page 10, item 7. Yeah, I, item 7 as well. Okay, thank you. Just wait a, a moment. A bit more detail for that. For, can we have a bit more detail for that for the record, please? Uh, yeah, we'll be declaring uh, pecuniary interest and we'll be leaving the meeting. And the same for me as well. If you just hang on a minute while I get up the uh, the next item, which is the um, uh, is questions pursuant to rule of procedure number fifteen, and we have a question from Councillor O'Brien, um, and I will now give the response. Uh, the response is: I can confirm this issue will be presented to members at the next meeting of the Community and Environment Committee in October. As agreed previously, trials and reviews of alternative weed control products have taken place. In addition, our community engagement team have been liaising with town and parish councils regarding the use of the current product, with some requesting for the practice to continue and others asking if the service in their area can be halted until an agreement is reached regarding the use of an alternative product. Further detail on this issue will be reported to the committee in October. Thank you very much. Uh, can I have a follow-up question, please, Chair? Yeah, by all means. Uh, Chris, very grateful for, for your very positive uh, response there. Um, but I notice in, the, in your reply, you refer to the welcome consultation with parish and town councils. Um, I don't know whether you yourself have read the, seen the consultation, but in it, the council does not say why stopping the use of glyphosate is being considered, namely that it is probably carcinogenic. And the consultation letter uh, specifically says that future control of weeds would have to be by chemical treatment. Thus already ruling out control by example uh, heat or steam treatment. Do you agree that this consultation therefore rather preempts the discussion or dis decision at this committee in October? Um, can I come back to you on that, uh, Councillor O'Brien? Of course, yes. Could I need you to discuss that with Cap. I need to discuss that with Councillor Purdy because he is down here to provide a verbal response. But uh, you, as you know, he's not here today. Would you mind copying your response to other colleagues? Yes, we'll do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chairman, I'm having a problem. I've got, for some reason, uh, the um, uh, keyboard has come up and I can't get rid of it. How do I, does anyone know how I get rid of the keyboard when it's come up? Oh, Jesus. Oh. <laughs> it won't go. <laughs> let me just, uh, let me just, I'll have to carry on with partial. A partial screen. I'm sorry to have troubled you. Can you only see half the screen then? Is that what you're saying? No. Okie doke. Well, well, we'll crack on with uh, item six, uh, which is the implementation of policy <clears throat> amendment five to the off street parking places order uh, 2013. Uh, Keith, would you like to talk us through that, please? Sorry, struggling to unmute there. <laughs> uh, yes, um, thank you very much. It's For those who've been through this before, it's a general housekeeping um, report. Uh, back in February, we um, proposed introducing control measures for the use of all of the new electric vehicle charge points. And in addition to that, we've built a new car park since the last amendment to the order. So this is a, a mopping up exercise to get the, um, the parking order up to date. 
Um, nothing else to report, uh, nothing else to add to that that's already in the report. Okay, so we'll open it to uh, questions. Um, James, are you there? James is keeping... I am, yeah, yes. Yeah, so All oh, right, um, okay. Have you sent me something? Sorry. I've got Councillor Froggart, uh, I have yes, Councillor Froggart, Councillor uh, Ratcliffe, Councillor Burford, Councillor Hobson, and Councillor Hughes. Okay, Councillor Froggart. You'll have to unmute, Helen. Sorry. Um, yeah, as Keith said, it's just general housekeeping. Uh, no representations, plain and simple. So I'm quite happy to move. Through. Sorry, James, who did you say was next? I've not, not got your WhatsApp up yet. Oh, I've got it now. Councillor Ratcliffe. Oh. Right, thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay, just yeah. A, a, a couple of um, minor questions in a sense, and one perhaps uh, perhaps for a little bit more consideration. I'll start with a very simple one, Keith, and it's good to have you back. I, I thought you'd gone on your travels, on your retirement. So really? I'm pleased that you're still with, with us, uh, though uh, no doubt uh, uh, you're coming towards the end of your uh, tenure, as it were. Right, first of all, Keith, if you would just uh, uh, remind me, perhaps, uh, what's happening to the land on which uh, the Thorpe car park uh, formerly stood? Uh, in short, it's not one I can answer. Perhaps it's something that Mike could update us on. Um, sorry to put you on the spot, Mike. That's a, a, a little late. It's, it's, an, it's an estate issue. Um, yeah, if, if I may, uh, Chair, just on, on that one. Um, I mean, the, the, the land um, that, that was um, car parking in front of the, the toilets at Thorpe, that's something that we're going to be looking at later this year okay. in conjunction with the, um, the toilet block itself about potential disposal. But we're also looking at um, the other uses that go on there and the various rights of way. So we're going through a process of looking at that at the moment. With a view to bringing a report to committee, um, probably in the autumn. Okay, thank you, Mike. That answers that question. Secondly, um, of course, uh, uh, here in Worksworth, uh, as in uh, some other uh, places, we're very grateful for the installation of the uh, electric vehicle charging charging the point. But it has crossed my mind, uh, 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 and this is only, uh, as it were, impromptu observation. Uh, it doesn't seem at this point in time to be receiving a great uh, deal of use. And I wondered if perhaps at some time um, in the uh, not too distant future, we couldn't just have a little bit of a, an update on the use being made of these electric charging points. Uh, I mean, quite how you would go about promoting the use, of course, uh, it would seem to me that that seems to be co uh, consequential to the use of electrical electric vehicles and uh, uh, observation of the public. But I just thought that perhaps at some point in the future we might uh, get a bit of an update uh, about uh, 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 them. And then just finally, uh, this is a more major question. It has crossed my mind since car parks in one form or another has come on to a number of council agendas. And they are, as we all uh, 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 agree, a, a really major asset and source of income for this uh, council. And I, again, I just wonder, perhaps next year, um, it would be useful to have, a, a, again, some sort of review uh, a, about them. The pressure on their use, Underuse, perhaps, the layout, need for resurfacing, control of illegal use. Uh, we've just heard about uh, Laura's uh, task today. Uh, 
and I hope that uh, went uh, well, Laura. Uh, and of course, the signage and um, uh, promotion of these car parks. I just think, you know, uh, given their priority within the council's agenda, that car park at some point would be make a very useful uh, review. Uh, and I notice we've got, um, where is he? Um, our chief executive with us, perhaps he, he might like to come in on that. Yes, Chairman, very happy to, to respond to Councillor Ratcliffe on that. Um, I mean, the last time the council did a fundamental review of its car parking policy was back in 2013, and that took approximately nine months to complete and involved the establishment of a subcommittee. So council in its corporate plan hasn't set aside as a priority review of its car parking policy, uh, but clearly as part of the COVID-19 situation, car parking income is absolutely critical to the district council. We have given an undertaking to have a look at that issue as part of our recovery plan. If members wanted to have a much more fundamental review of car parking in the same way that we did it in 2013, that would need to be built into our uh, work programme accordingly and, and resourced. But we could certainly bring that back to members should that be the wish. Thank you, Paul. And I'm very happy to second uh, this uh, report and move it on. Yeah, thank you, Councillor. Councillor Burford. I don't, I'm not sure if that's Martin or Sue. No, it's Martin. Yeah, <laughs> she hasn't got a beard. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd like to uh, just echo what uh, Councillor Ratcliffe said uh, about uh, about Keith and the, his retirement. So if and when he does leave us, I'd like to wish him all the best for the future. Because obviously, I've known him for quite a number of years. But um, also echoing uh, what Councillor Ratcliffe said about electrical charging, electrical vehicle charging points. Um, I'm wondering if there be any updates required to uh, this report or this order, if and when there are further requirements for additional charging points, because obviously that's going to come. We've only got one or two in each town at the moment. Uh, so if, this, if the uh, need in terms of climate change objectives arises and there's a greater demand for uh, charge points, off-road charge points in our car parks and elsewhere, then uh, will we ha how will we bring those in? Will it just be done as a as a one-off and without any further consideration by this committee, apart from probably approval of them uh, 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 one at a time, or will it be a, a review of this particular order? Um, thank you, Chair, if I may, and without trying to don my anorak and keep it going on too long, um, the wording of the particular order amendments that are laid out in the in the appendix should give blanket coverage to most of the car parks. You'll see one little anomaly in there, which is Edgefold Road, which at present is a one hour free um, car park. Naturally, if somebody was to use a charge point, they may well need more than one hour on there. So there is a clause written into that particular car park to allow for continued use beyond one hour. The rest of the car parks, um, which we assume that the, the uh, charging points will go on to pay and display car parks. The, the general terminology in that amendment will cover all of those. There's no need to change schedules or maps or anything. So it should be relatively straightforward. That was a quick one for me, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks Keith. You're welcome. Uh, Council Councillor Hobson. Uh, thank you, Chair. I've got a note in my diary that this is Keith's last meeting, so uh, I, I would like to wish him well on behalf of uh, all our I've members. Got, I've volunteered for one more, Councillor, which oh, is, have you? Um, I believe an emergency one in early September. Oh, we're ahead of ourselves then. Well, thank you, Keith. <laughs> Bad penny, I keep turning up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Councillor Hughes. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this is one about signage, a question about signage again. Will it be, will the signage make it clear that uh, uh, about payment for parking against payment for using the charge point so that there's no ambiguity associated with that? And uh, the second, second question really is about uh, the first, or comment really, about the, the first part of the amendment, which is the definition of electric charging point. I, I feel that that may uh, be over, 
over at the May, at some stage, we're going to move to inductive charging for cars, at which point another amendment will be required, but that, I'm sure that will happen in the fullness of time. And then uh, the third point, I, I'd like to just bring up the idea of uh, mounting solar panels above car parking spaces, as happens in, for example, Aviva car parks, Aviva insurance company car parks, and uh, in, a, in places in the United States as well. So that this would form another source of income for the council and uh, in, in, in terms of um, payment for, for uh, the solar, solar power that was generated by the car parks. Thank you. Um, if I may come back on that, the signage uh, element, without actually going out to the site now and taking a look, all of the signage should now be in place. Uh, and it should be implicit on there that there is a, both the fee to pay for the electricity that's drawn from the unit, but in occupying the bay that parking charges apply. Okay, thank you. I, I will double check, um, but I'm fairly confident that all of that signage is now in place. Um, with regard to your last point about um, drawing income from uh, solar panels, that's certainly one for my successor to consider. Uh, I can't see it being in the immediate future, but I would like to point out that we do not draw income from the electric vehicle charging. We, we continue to draw income from the parking charges. Thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, well, I've got no further uh, questions now. Nobody's listed to speak. Uh, it has been moved and seconded. So can we go to the vote, please, Jackie? Yeah. Uh, Councillor Atkin. Paul. 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 Barefoot. Paul. Battle. Sorry about that. Yes, four. Thank you. Donnelly. Four. Roggett. Four. Vaness. Four. Campbell. Four. Hobson. Four. Hughes. Four. Morley. Four. O'Brien. Four. Pawley. Four. Four. Ratcliffe. Four. Sutton. Four. Wayne. Four. And Wakeman. Four. That's unanimous. Yeah, thank you. And just before Keith leaves, leaves us, I will just say a few words of tribute because uh, this this will be his last C and E committee meeting, at least before he retires. Uh, Keith has worked in local government since 1980. He came to us from Ashfield District Council in 1991. He's covered many service areas, including parks and gardens, car parks and burial grounds, and he's been particularly involved in car park reviews and green flag awards. And more recently, the introduction of electric vehicle charging in our car parks. Keith leaves us in October and will be replaced by Vicky Hatfield. He's already purchased, I'm told, his retirement uh, present, which is a canal boat, aptly named the Great Escape. Keith, we thank you for your nearly 30 years of loyal service to Dobbsdales and wish you many happy years of retirement, both on and off the water. Thanks very much, Keith. Thank you very much, Councillor. Thank you. And every year, every single minute of it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Good, good. Yeah, I will miss you. Talking of Great Escape, I'm going to leave the meeting now, if I may. You, you're excused. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, OK, item seven. Uh, it's the form of public conveniences and land transfer at Monsell Head. Uh, Mike, please. Okay, yeah, thank you, Chair. Well, this is a fairly self-explanatory uh, report and is, is really a sort of good news uh, story. Um, just a couple of things to add um, to, the, to the report. So the, um, the community interest company that's been formed um, to take over operation of the, the public toilets at Monsell Head, uh, which is run by um, councillors Gamble and, and, and Waitman, um, have confirmed um, that uh, uh, well, they've, they've given us some more information about how they will continue to run the facility with regard to funding um, uh, to, to, to keep the uh, to keep the facility running after after the, after it opens so what they've said is that um, in in working up the um, 
their, their plans. They've had a lot of assistance from the two local parish councils, both Great Longstone Parish and um, Little Longstone Parish Meeting, but also from Ashford in the Water Parish Council, who have um, got experience in taking over one of our uh, ex-public uh, conveniences. And with regards to um, funding um, for, the, for the future, they have had some um, financial support from some of those parish councils, uh, but they're also applying for lottery funding and funding from the National Park Authority, together with using online funding for some of the user groups that, that um, frequent the area, particularly around Monsell Head, particularly the Ramblers Association and some cycle groups. But they'll also be putting a donation box um, on site as well. So those are their plans for how they will continue to fund um, the the, the facility when it opens um, and other than that I'm happy to answer any questions thank you okay uh, councillor Atkin yeah thank you very much chair I'm glad now this has been resolved because it's been dragging on for such a long time um, keep this open so I'll move the recommendation as set out in the paperwork chair thank you councillor Hobson Chair, I'm, I'm happy to second the motion. Uh, as you know, toilets are not a statutory responsibility uh, of, of the authority, but uh, are always welcome to member the, members of the public, I'm sure. And I wish the community interest company the best of luck. Thank you. Councillor Ratcliffe. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, I, I wish them every success. Uh, I have to say I'm absolutely delighted, that, in fact, that they have come forward uh, because there was a possibility with uh, the hotel uh, withdrawing that we might lose it. And uh, as uh, perhaps colleagues will know, uh, certainly myself and uh, Councillor Pauly and O'Brien and uh, others I know have long uh, been campaigning for uh, conveniences to be supported by the District Council and to be kept open wherever possible. Of course, a number of them have been transferred into parish or town council ownership. Uh, so it's very good to see uh, this interest group coming forward and to be supported by some of the local parish uh, parishes uh, there. I was going to ask questions about uh, income and um, uh, related finance, but I think Mike, you, you pretty much uh, covered uh, that uh, without actually necessarily uh, uh, giving us the the, the full uh, detail. But we don't actually need to know that. All we need to know is, is that uh, uh, the interest group uh, are happy with the terms, are moving forward, and, and they feel they've got, they've got a, a sound business uh, case. Uh, 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 bit behind them. The one thing that I, I, I just have a little anxiety about and I'd like perhaps some feedback about, though I know it's difficult, if this should venture should fail at some point in the near future, what's the likelihood of the district council getting either behind them or indeed uh, the, the parish councils there just to keep this going and keep it open. Okay, no response on that. Councillor uh, Hughes. Chair, oh. Chair, I'm happy to respond on that. Um, okay. Members will be very well aware of the reasons why we had to transfer and close some public conveniences and it does come down to finance. So I think at, at that particular point in time, should that happen, members would clearly need to reflect upon our financial ability to support such enterprises. Um, clearly, we wish them every success in the hope that this enterprise succeeds, um, but it will come down to the very same considerations that members were faced two years ago when you did the public convenience review. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Councillor Hughes. Thank you, Chair. Uh, as you will probably know that I'm very concerned about the closure of public toilets and I'm pleased to, to see that the ones that Monsell Head are likely to stay open, particularly it's a very popular tourist spot. 
However, um, I'm, I am a little concerned about future income and the ability of the parish councils to support this going forward. Uh, Matlock Town Council has, uh, runs its own toilets and, that, and it is a considerable expense even for the town council. Uh, so I, was, I wanted to ask a question about um, under three point, in, in paragraph 3.1, which states that, and then the third bullet in that states, the use of the public convenience building will be restricted to a public convenience with ancillary use as a concession by imposition of a restrictive covenant. Uh, I'd, I was wondering if, uh, if it was possible to give some examples of, of concessions that would be possible under that restrictive covenant. Thank you. Any response uh, on that? Yeah, yeah, if I could uh, respond, Chair. Yeah. So, um, I mean, the reason we've put that in there is that it does give a little bit of flexibility. Obviously, the main use for the building is a public toilet, um, and it's not the biggest building in the world. It, you know, it's a fairly, fairly small building. But potentially, um, you could have a small kiosk in there, um, obviously subject to planning consent and everything else that, that um, could sell um, snacks or drinks or whatever to, um, to the, the, the tourists that visit the area. So it was really um, in, in, in putting restrictions on that limit the use so that it can't be used for something that's basically a, a non-community use. Um, we did want to give a bit of flexibility to allow um, some additional income to be brought in if that was seen to be uh, practicable in the future, rather than just have a blanket covenant and then have to, you know, get, get applications to release it and that sort of thing. Okay, th thank you very much for that answer. I'm gratified to hear that because I, I think they will, they, that will help them through um, with, with providing income to run the toilet. So, so I'm very pleased to hear that. Um, possibly we could adopt that approach in, in other public toilets, for example, at Artist Corner, where uh, there's a significant demand for toilets and the toilets have been closed for some time uh, to the detriment of the people who live in the area. Thank you very much. Uh, Jackie, can I just check that councillors Gamble and Wakeman have left the meeting temporarily? Um, I can't see Councillor Wakeman and it looks like Councillor Gamble's waiting to be readmitted. Oh, OK. Um, Councillor Buttle. Hi there. Yeah, um, it's great. Excellent solution to an inconvenient uh, well, in inconvenient situation is we need to thank uh, Mike Goldsworthy and Ashford Great and Little Longston Parish Councils. I think it's a great thing and well done all. Thank you. Councillor Wayne. Thank you, Chair. Marvellous news this is. I've re been really impressed with the excellent work that, of this community in Chesco, that what they've put in. Um, facing some adversity with the toilets being closed down in the first place, uh, they've been supported, they've worked together from being from adjoining wards and they've effectively, effectively challenged and overcome various issues. I just hope, because alluding to what Councillor Hughes has mentioned, that on social media recently there have been a lot of issues with the um, artist corner toilets and faeces outside. I sincerely hope that other community groups follow this lead and hopefully get some support from the council and we can once again have adequate public conveniences for our communities and visitors. Um, I think it's marvellous and I hope we all support them and I wish them well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor O'Brien. Yes, thank you, Chair. I wanted to add my, my thanks to, uh, to Mark and Claire for helping to resolve what, what has been a quite an acrimonious situation at at times, um, but out of respect to them, um, I know they are councillors, but as far as I'm aware, the community interest company is set up as, as with them as two private private individuals. So perhaps we should respect that and um, uh, not not continue to refer to to it being set up by two councillors, but by by two uh, res respected members of, of the community. I think that that would be fair to them to both of them. Councillor Morley. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, it touches on uh, the funding issues going forward, uh, and I'd like to offer some practical help 
Um, over many years now, I've been lucky enough to sit on a number of grants panels at Prince's Trust and so on and so on. And I'm our representative for Derbyshire Dales CVS and I sit on their grants panel. So I've got a lot of experience in writing bids and I'd like to offer my services as a bid writer for them. We've done quite a lot down in here in Dufferidge. We have six successful bids lately. Uh, they will have found out already from the... Um, the National Lottery, I'm assuming they're looking at the Awards for All, which is the grants up to 10,000 quid. And a lot of it at the moment is set aside for COVID, but that won't last. So as things change, as long as they know that I'm there to back them up when they're bid writing. Uh, and I would, I think, congratulations and well done. Thanks, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Pawley. Yes, Chair. Um, I, well, I would like to say it's um, marvellous that we've got this facility up and up and running. Uh, it's a fantastic result, that. And congratulations to everybody involved. We've been trying to do the same in Matlock Bath for the, uh, to replace the pavilion toilets. Um, and I've had quite a few difficulties. Uh, we're trying to get the money through uh, from the lottery fund. So uh, I should be knocking on your door, uh, Councillor Waitman and Councillor Gamble, to see how you've managed it. <laughs> That's very good. We've got no nobody else to speak, as far as I can see. Hang on a minute. Uh, no, that's it. So uh, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, Jackie, would you like to go to the vote, please? Yes, sir. Uh, Councillor Atkin. Four. 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 Barefoot. Four. I didn't ask to speak actually, but I wasn't called. Sorry. Battle. Sorry about that. Uh, yes, absolutely. Four. Donnelly. Four. Dovett. Four. Finesse. Four. Hobson. Four. Hughes. Four. Morley. Four. O'Brien. Four. Hawley. Four. Ratcliffe. Four. Sutton. Four. And Wayne. Four. Unanimous. Is that unanimous, Jackie? No, that's it. Sorry, unanimous. Oh, unanimous, okay. Yeah, thank you. And thanks very much, Mike. Uh, you are relieved now if you wish to uh, depart. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll move on to item eight. Um, this is housing enforcement, civil penalties and banning orders. Uh, Tim, please, if you go through this. Thank you, Chair. Um, in introducing this report, if I may also introduce Laura Salmon, who's on the uh, second row up on my screen. She's Laura's one of our environmental health officers who deals with this, this oh, item. Uh, and, um, and she's been working quietly in the background to get these reports together. She is, in fact, the true author of the next three reports, although they're in my name. Um, what I'll do is I'll, I'll ask Laura to speak on a couple of bits and pieces in relation to the reports and bring her in on the questions as well, because frankly, she knows more about them than I do. For the benefit of new members, uh, private sector housing enforcement is one of the tasks that our environmental health team does in the background. Um, when we get complaints from tenants, they go out and assess the properties and make sure that they're brought up to the appropriate standard where that's necessary. Um, what this report does is it introduces the concept of using civil penalties uh, as an alternative to the more traditional means of uh, pursuing housing, housing offences. Traditionally, where a landlord doesn't keep a property up to scratch, um, the job of our environmental health team will be to serve an enforcement notice um, and then, if necessary, to pursue action against for, for non-compliance with the notice through the courts. And what this does is it enables the council to levy a financial charge instead of going to court. Um, in reality, most private sector housing cases, along with most of our enforcement cases, are resolved by the environmental health team uh, through informal means. Our corporate enforcement policy suggests that we should use a phased approach to enforcement and, and try and encourage compliance rather than, uh, rather than forcing it where that's appropriate. Um, so through their expertise, they managed to resolve most of these cases without the need for firstly the service of an improvement notice and certainly without the need to go to court. Um, in reality, a handful of notices are served each year and every two or three years we might end up in court with a recalcitrant landlord. Um, you'll see from the report that civil penalties can range uh, right the way up to £30,000 for the most serious offences. Um, 
However, you know, fines at those levels will be very rare. Um, and it's much more likely that any civil penalties that we level will be towards the lower end of the spectrum. Um, what I was going to do at this point was ask Laura to say a few words about the matrix that's in, in Appendix 1 to the report that explains how we would, um, how we would determine the level of penalty. So if, I'm, if I may ask you to join in, Laura. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, the matrix that, we, that we've devised is um, based on Sheffield City Council's model. Uh, it's been highly recommended through our built environment group with all the districts and boroughs. Um, the fines are based on the level of harm and culpability of the landlord um, and it's risk assessed as if we would risk assess the, the offence itself, um, which helps then to determine the level of fine which is suitable for that offence on its own merit. That's all I was going to say in introducing the report, uh, uh, Chair, but if there are any questions from anybody, I'll, I'll field them first and bring in Laura when, when she knows more than I do. Okay, well, thanks very much, and thank you, Laura. Um, Councillor Hobson. Chair, I'm, I'm happy to move the report. Thank you to Tim and Laura for all their work preparing this. The safety of private te sector tenants is vitally important, and I'm pleased to hear that uh, the number of offences in our area is fairly rare. Uh, Councillor Atkin. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I'd just like to echo what Councillor Hobson said, and I'll second the recommendations as set out. Councillor Ratcliffe. Thank you, Chair. I have to say, to some degree, you wonder um, w w whether uh, we should have had something like this some years ago, though I understand from what Tim was saying, there has been a mechanism uh, of... Uh, legal redress, as it were, to recalcitrant uh, um, landlords. But given the number of uh, cases that seems to crop up in the news uh, media uh, each year on uh, fire-related deaths through the absence of smoke alarms or indeed carbon monoxide deaths, it just seemed to me um, that there is something that we should be doing in order to prevent in some way these tragedies. Now one of the things that did strike me uh, about this tenancy landlord situation that we have at the moment is it may well be that a number of these very poor uh, properties, shall we say, are actually tenanted by refugees or immigrants who perhaps have some apprehension about um, eviction or indeed putting their heads, shall we say, above the metaphorical parapet. And uh, it just seemed to me that uh, they're the people that we've also got to be d defending. Uh, so, uh, uh, the, the, the question I, I think it, that is lingering in my mind is um, uh, how is it, how do we monitor it as it were to see that it's effective rather than relying just on someone to make that complaint, which in, in a sense is, as I say, bringing them in, into a confrontation with their, uh, their landlord. Uh, how is this going to be promoted so that we give tenants that assurance that there is someone on their side and if they, you know, take the action of becoming a whistleblower, shall we say, about a defective property, that action can be taken and be taken without any redress to them. Okay, Chair, I'll, I'll pick those up and, and Laura, please introduce, uh, please interrupt me if I, if I go astray. Um, how do we monitor? Well, Councillor Ratcliffe, um, I think Councillor Ratcliffe knows, knows that we offer a largely reactive service and I, th I think that was implicit in the question. Uh, that's true and that's based on the level of resource that we've got to, do it, to, to deal with the situation. Um, we have just received, though, a final draft of the latest housing conditions survey that we've undertaken for the private sector in our area. Officers are currently considering that and we'll bring that forward before committee at some stage in the not too distant future. 
uh, for some thoughts about how we might use that information that we've been given. Uh, certainly that, the, that suggests that there might be a more proactive way of doing things. The next two reports, which also link to private sector housing issues, will also talk about some of the proactive work that Laura and Matthew are doing behind the scenes. Um, but it is a largely reactive service and we rely on people reporting issues. Sometimes that's the tenants and sometimes it's other agencies. Councillor Ratcliffe spoke about uh, migrants living in, in poor conditions. Uh, and just so as you know that we, we're not entirely problem free, we did have a situation where a health visitor actually reported to the team about 16 Bulgarians living in a, in a flat above uh, food premises somewhere in the district. Um, the team investigated that and resolved the issue. That only came to notice because the health visitor was involved because uh, a baby had been born within that group. Um, so, so we do have a good um, referral mechanism with, with our partners in, in things like church, children's services, adult care and the fire service. Um, how do we promote? We, um, we have used landlords forums in the past as a way of promoting to landlords. Uh, there isn't such a thing as a tenants forum, but we can obviously use the social media links that we've got to promote these, these issues, and we're happy to do that. Uh, and the final question, I think, is um, how can we ensure that action can be taken without redress? I'm sad to report that the honest answer is we can't. And um, Retaliatory evictions are not illegal um, and do happen from time to time. It's not an area that we've suffered great problems with, but we know it does exist. Um, in Derbyshire Dales, we have very few in the way of portfolio landlords. We tend to deal with uh, people who maybe own one or two properties in the main. Um, and the issues that Laura and the team pick up are, are often to do with um, some of those landlords not knowing any better rather than being deliberate, deliberately twisting their, their, their role, I, I think it's fair to say. But whenever those situations arise, we deal with each case on its merits, as Laura said, uh, and we, we come to the correct uh, we, we, we work out the correct way of dealing with it to end up with a good property. Uh, and that's what this report is about. It's another tool in the box for, um, uh, for encouraging landlords to, to comply. The threat of £30,000 would, would make me do some work on property, frankly, if I was a landlord. Chair, if I just make a, a, a comment, if you'd allow me. Certainly. Tim quite rightly picked up on, on my uh, allusion, as it were, to resources for this. It, it didn't escape my notice that not only do we have this report, but the, the next two, uh, again, are within Tim's remit. And I say this without any fear of being accused of patronisation. Tim's department seems to me one of the very significant departments carrying out social tasks, as it were, on behalf of residents in this uh, Derbyshire Dales of ours. And he does it with total professionalism uh, and always uh, with uh, the assistance of uh, his assistants uh, who deserve every credit. But he does it with such poor, I, I, I don't quite know how to describe it, as, as though somehow central government seems to think that, you know, we can pull rabbits out the hat and do things without proper, proper uh, finance or, or support. And it's a real credit, not only to him, but to this council that we managed to provide such a service for Derbyshire at Dell's residence. I'm well aware that this, uh, as many other uh, forums, uh, uh, committees, it is in the uh, public domain and there may be people looking. So I, I hope they're picking up this point that it really is about time that central government acknowledge the good work that lo local authorities like ours and all their officers are doing for communities across across this country and really giving them the tools to do it properly. Thanks very much. <clears throat> Martin, uh, Councillor Burfoot. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I think I would echo much of what Councillor Ratcliffe has just said, but also 
if you look at the introduction to the report, you see that we're considering these offences under the Housing Act 2004 and the Housing and Planning Act of 2016. So is the reason why it's taken four years and more for this report to be brought to this committee? A lack of resources, both staffing and, and, and financial. And the next question, which is related to some extent, is uh, you know, given, given the random dispersal of privately rented properties in the Dales and other rural areas, particularly unlike towns where you get a whole row or street of houses that are mainly um, rented properties, um, even in Matlock, um, we, we, we can't necessarily identify all the, visually, all the uh, rented properties, except possibly by the state of the, the fabric, on, on the external fabric that we can see from the street. So um, is this uh, another reason why, or is a lack of staff particularly, another reason why uh, we need extra funding to, to fulfil this, this uh, work effectively? And the, the next question is to do with, and Tim will be familiar with this, about the HMOs, as a particular HMO in Matlock, which is causing enormous problems for neighbouring residents and so on, and for our staff in environmental health. So can I ask, you know, if, if HMOs throughout the district are a particular source of concern, and if uh, there are any measures that can be taken under this uh, facility to try to arrest this problem and ensure that the uh, social, the landlords who own these and operate these HMOs uh, are, are brought to boot basically and to, uh, and to improve the um, maintenance and the standard of upkeep of these premises, which obviously a source of embarrassment to all of us in the areas where we, where we know they exist. Thank you, Chair. Um, in relation to the first question about the, um, uh, the delay in bringing the report before committee, um, it's about priorities, really. Um, as I said earlier, we, we, we don't have um, such massive problems with rented property that, um, that we weren't able to deal with them under existing provisions. As explained in the report, we, we can, and, and in my preamble, we can already serve notices and take people to court where it's appropriate to do so. And where it is appropriate to do so, we don't hesitate to do that. So the team has been dealing with these issues all the way through the, the last few years, um, but hasn't had the need to resort to civil penalties in order to, to, to come to resolutions. Um, nevertheless, it would be foolish to ignore that forever. Um, and if we can bring some money in to help support our, our housing work, then, then that's all well and good. So we, as we were considering it, we thought that this was something we did need to bring in. Um, Councillor Buffett's quite, quite right that there are limited resources at all levels in the council, both at, at, at the strategic level to get these reports written and done and at the officer level to, to do the work in the field. Um, and that's, that's one another reason why it hasn't been prioritised ahead of now. If we had limitless resources, we'd have done it before. Um, in terms of the distribution of property, yes, that is an issue. Um, it's sometimes easier for us to spot some of the problem properties in the built up areas of, of the district. Um, and we don't even notice some of the ones out in the rural areas. Um, in considering the house condition survey, and as I say, I don't want to spoil the thunder, the thunder of bringing that to committee later on in the year. Um, our biggest problem areas with lots of those issues are out in the sticks, that they're not in the towns. It, it, often cases in, in the towns, the properties are much more well-maintained and have better standards of, of, of built fabric uh, than some of the rural properties. Our greatest areas of fuel poverty, for example, are, 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 are very much in the west of the district rather than, than on the Matlock side. In relation to houses of multiple occupation, we actually only have two licensable houses of multiple occupation in the entire district. Um, not all houses in multiple occupation require licensing. Uh, where the, the proprietors of those properties are committing offences um, and where it would be appropriate to do so, then we would serve notices and, and uh, issue civil penalties if it was appropriate to do that too. Um, of course, they have to be committing offences for us to do that. Um, the, these offences relate to the condition of the property um, rather than necessarily the, um, the behaviour of the occupants. And Councillor Verfer knows what I'm getting at because we've had those conversations offline as well. But we'll continue to deal with those, uh, uh, Chair and Councillor Verfer, in, in the correct way, the best way that we can. Um, in that particular case, there are other agencies involved as well. Is that okay, Councillor? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councillor Verfer, have you put your hand down? Yes, he has, Chair. Oh, I think you've got councillors Wayne and Pawley waiting to speak. Yes, as well. I have. It's just that I've been asked to ask uh, councillor because it, it, 
I think you're keeping up for a bit long, you know, so it's confusing people. Um, so next is Councillor Wayne. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, just a couple of things. Uh, I did uh, phone Mr. Brond earlier on this afternoon and we had a long chat about this, but there's just a couple of things that have come out, come to light since. Um, can we, as an organisation, work with uh, other, other partners like health, the police, etc.? We may already do that, but can we push it a little bit now we, to let them know about that we, we're going to enforce this legislation, hopefully, and um, to get feedback? Because it does concern me that there will be a, a number. We, we all think we live in a very nice rural area, which we do, but there will be people out there that are living in less than savoury conditions. And I just think if we could do something through the media or social media and with our partner agencies, that would be very good. The second thing is this legislation has been knocking around since I think 2019 active. Um, can, can, can we be assured that should a matter come in next week, uh, we've got all the necessary protocols and documentation ready to go? And we, we're able to enforce if if we get an if we get a property next week, uh, a landlord, are we in a position now? We've got all the documentation, and if we deem it pertinent, we can then pursue them. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Um, well, thank you, Councillor Wayne. In relation to the referral mechanisms, that that's something I've been working on for about twenty years, and it comes around in cycles. Um, at the moment, uh, health partners, we, we engage with our health partners through something called the, uh, the Place Alliance, the Area Place Alliance. Um, that, those meetings have been offline during COVID whilst uh, community response has been more um, reactive, I suppose, but it's coming back online. One of the items that's scheduled for discussion is the stock condition survey on there, so we'll be starting talking around those housing issues. Um, we also have a county-wide health and housing group, which is chaired by the Director of Public Health at the County Council. Um, that, that discusses the broader, wider determinants of health and housing issues rather than necessarily the district specific ones. So we do have those two mechanisms, but very much so the, the health and housing group wants uh, the various stock condition surveys that have been carried out across the whole of the county to be discussed at the Place Alliance meetings so that we get buy in from partners in, in, in primary care um, and, and community health services as well. So, so that's very much going on. We've also, uh, through the Place Alliance, we helped to found uh, uh, a community multidisciplinary team, which meets every fortnight at the Whitworth Hospital to discuss specific cases. Um, so we have that input into there as well. Often we find that the people that, are, if you like, frequent flyers in the health environment are also our clients too. Um, so, so we do have those discussions and we'll continue to have those. Actually a matter that's quite dear to my heart, so thanks for that question. Um, in relation, to whether we're weathered, in, in relation to whether we're ready to go if we had a case come in next week, certainly in terms of the notices and the usual enforcement procedures that would precede any civil penalty, we are. I'll ask Laura to comment on how ready we are with paperwork on civil penalties. Yeah, I've produced most of the documents necessary for um, compliance notices and, and letters ready to go to landlords should we follow that route. Thanks, Laura. Thanks, Tim. Cheers. Hey, thank you. Councillor Pawley. My question's been answered. Thank you, Chair. OK, I've no other. Nobody else has listed. Does anybody else want to speak? No. OK, it's been moved and seconded. So can we go to the vote, please, Jackie? Mm -hmm. Councillor Atkin. Paul. 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 Burford. Paul. Battle. Four. Donnelly. Four. Froggett. Four. Vaness. Four. Campbell. Four. Hobson. Four. Hughes. Four. Morley. Four. O'Brien. Four. Corley. Four. Ratcliffe. Four. Sutton. Four. Wayne. Four. And Wakeman. Four. Unanimous. Thank you, Jackie. Um, items we items nine and ten. There are also similarities um, in these. So to avoid uh, repetition, I'm going to ask Tim to talk through both of them together. Uh, we will, of course, debate and, and vote on them separately. 
but I think it's sensible for him to uh, talk through the two together. OK, thanks, Tim. Thank you, Chair. Yes, they are very similar. And the reason they're done as separate reports is because they involve uh, different pieces of legislation. Uh, longer standing members will be used to me occasionally bringing reports about delegated authority and levels of fine and the like, and this is one of those. Uh, again, it relates to private sector housing work, uh, and Laura's authored both these reports. Um, one, of the, one of the issues in private sector housing over which we receive the most complaints and about which we can take action is what's known as the hazard of excess cold within the housing health and safety rating system. Where Councillor Flitter here tonight, he might flinch at those words because he once asked me a question about how that system worked. I'm told my answer went on for 25 minutes, so members might like to bear that in mind. Um, but but the, these, these reports, the first one deals with a, a situation where a property has been rented without an energy performance certificate being provided, which is now in itself an offence. The second report deals with a property that's been left with an energy performance certificate, but it's in a band F and G, which is F and or G, which are the two worst performing categories on the energy performance certificate. Um, you might note from the report that the, these were powers that to some degree were delegated to the county council through their trading standards team. The county council have, have rightly decided after a number of years that they're not in a position to enforce these. Their trading standards team don't deal with private sector housing issues. And they've asked for the districts and boroughs in Derbyshire to take on those responsibilities. So this report is a response to that, that change in delegation. Um, so really what they do is they describe those situations um, and they describe de the delegations that we're proposing should, should exist, which is to the environmental health team dealing with private sector housing issues uh, and the level of fixed penalty that we're suggesting. Um, what I would do at this point, though, is ask Laura to give you a little bit of a, a, a background on some work she's been doing to prepare for this. Uh, and this is an area where um, a couple of members talked about proactive work earlier. This is an area where the team are able to do some proactive work and are targeting their actions. So, Laura, if I could bring you in. Thank you, Tim. Yes, um, Count Derbyshire County Council's Healthy Homes team, um, a lady called Rena Jones, has, has scanned, there's, a, there's a, an online register for when you commission an EPC, it is placed against a register online held by government, uh, and you can search that register for all the commissioned EPCs, and they should be placed in a category either in the private rented sector or for a private home. So we've been given a list of all the ones um, for the private rented sector that, that don't meet the minimum standard of E um, for the minimum efficiency standards. Um, our licensing apprentice, um, James Rigott Collins, through lockdown, has checked every single one of these properties. I think there's um, over 600 um, to check that the EPC rating hasn't changed um, to, to narrow our, our, our focus down. And he, he's done all of that for us. Um, and, and we have reduced the list somewhat. Um, and we now that that's been done and checked, we started writing to the owners and landlords of the properties that don't meet uh, the minimum efficiency standards. We're doing these in bulk um, so many at a time. We've put the feelers out and, and sent so many. Um, and we're getting some really good feedback from landlords and owners. Um, some are on, uh, before lockdown, we're, we're doing the work. Um, some are empty properties now. Um, so the list is, is being worked through in that way. Happy to take any questions, Chair, on, on that. Oh, well, on either report, really. Okay, Councillor Wakeman. Yes, sir, I want to thank you for an excellent report here. Um, and I'm going to move this report, please. Uh, Councillor Hobson. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm happy to second the report. Um, thank uh, Laura and Tim for all their hard work, and especially James, whose uh, substantial amount of work has been highlighted by this report. Uh, improving standards in the private rented sector it is a vitally important role. Thank you. Councillor Ratcliffe. Councillor Ratcliffe. Councillor Ratcliffe, are you there? You need to unmute, Mike. That's it, okay. M my trackpad uh, had uh, momentarily froze. Anyway, um, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, as I remarked before, uh, this is very um, in, in similar territory to, to the previous one. Uh, 
Now, uh, it's pretty clear, I think, that there will be uh, landlords who will uh, push things as far as, you know, they're, they're able to go, as it were, uh, until enforcement uh, or, the, or the, the big stick is shown to them. Uh, but I, I just wonder to myself whether uh, perhaps a, 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 a little bit of a, a dangling the carrot would also uh, help to rectify this sort of situation. Uh, and, and that is, you know, promoting information on how you can update uh, your properties in terms of energy efficiency uh, and providing the links to seek the funding because there is funding out there, of course, for um, uh, you know, infrastructure uh, in, improvements. Um, so uh, uh, that's a sort of general thought, but perhaps a, a specific question to uh, Laura, if she has this information, I, I've always wondered about precisely what these alphabetical designations mean in terms of temperatures. Uh, we talk about the uh, minimum rating of E. What temperature band does that cover? If my property was an E band, what sort of temperature would I be uh, living in? Thank you, Councillor Ratcliffe. Um, they don't they, they don't relate to temperatures. Ah, oh, I thought they did. They relate to the energy efficiency of that property. So a, a band A, a property would be the most efficient, that they've got the most efficient heating system and the property can hold the heat in. The carbon footprint of that property is less. Right. So a, a band G is the worst efficient property. So their property releases heat, it doesn't keep it in, like poor windows or a poor heating system and with a higher carbon footprint. And that's how that scale is worked out. Right, thank you very much. I, I hadn't realised that. This shows you, doesn't it? You know, I, I, I've seen these energy efficiency stickers on, uh, you know, domestic appliances, but I've always thought that in a, a building they relate to the working or uh, habitable temperature. No, good, thank you. Okay, Councillor Burfoot. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to um, well, thank, uh, obviously, Laura and Tim for this report. Um, and just to ask if the, the requirement for these en energy performance uh, certificates uh, has, has resulted in, in, in significant extra work for our staff and funding as well, since the County Council a delegated authority to the district council, and um, I, I also wonder, given the, um, the the fact that the statistics which Laura has given us tonight about the numbers that uh, um, have been contacted, had to be contacted, the owners of properties that have been contacted in terms of the lack of uh, attention to this uh, matter, uh, whether you know obviously it, it, it doesn't stand still at, at any particular time. So, uh, if a survey has been done in terms of the the present uh, uh, number of properties that are privately rented that need to be uh, investigated. Uh, what happens in the future? I mean, obviously there, there are new properties coming online that others uh, on, uh, perhaps that don't comply with the standards that did in previous years uh, as a deterioration, for instance. So what happens about those? Does that require a lot of extra work in terms of revisiting and, and doing a, a re-survey of, of all the rented properties? Jim. Thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll kick off with this and, and Laura may come in towards the end. I'm quite proud to tell you that, that actually this is something that Laura has driven from, um, from, the, from the environmental health officer level rather than me telling them to do. Um, it's very keen to get this off the ground. It is a, this is a particular project as opposed to, to day job at the moment, um, but will become part of the routine private sector housing enforcement offer that we, that we give. Um, I guess uh, we want to work our way through the cohort that we've currently got, the 600 or so properties that Laura talked about, uh, and resolve those, and then we'll look again um, at where we are. The idea being to gradually improve the overall standard of, of the private rented sector. Um, Laura, is there anything to add to, add to that? I think I reiterate that you, what you said at pre-meeting about um, the, the don't be alarmed necessarily by the amount of numbers of properties. It reflects the, the aged housing stock within the district um, and, and the, the rural properties as well. 
uh, it, it's not necessarily that the particularly bad landlords with a particularly bad property it can be down to age and just to come back to councillor donnell if you don't mind um that uh the 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 epcs are, are required um but they also become part of what you were someone was saying earlier about illegal evictions that you cannot evict your tenant without uh, a commissioned epc so that helps in in the tenant's respect as well but for that that kind of work thank you councillor wayne Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just want a clarification of what Laura said, if that's in order. Um, was I right in listening that there are 600 houses that were in band F and G? Uh, is, is that what you said, Laura? There were over 600 properties on the list that was provided. Um, we have managed to break a lot of that down. Um, a lot of those have, have, have realised the legislation has come in and that the legislation has changed and therefore they've commissioned and done the work. Um, and the letters that we send out also do send links to government funding um, and, and how they, the, the help can be provided. Um, and, and that's been uh, pushed out as well by um, estate agents. We've contacted lots of those um, and, and they're all on board with this. And, and, and our, some of our biggest estates are, are already commissioning their properties to meet the standards. That, that, that's great. Anything that helps with the PCs to drive down you know, carbon is, is, is great. Who, who actually is responsible? Is, does that fall within your voluntary remit at the moment to uh, go and check that all the work's being undertaken to a certain standard? Or who would that fall to, please? Once the work is being complete, then they would have to have a, a reassessment and a new EPC carried out. Um, I believe EPC, EPC assessors are... Um, part of, a, of a, a, an assessed group themselves um, and they have to be trained to do that job properly. Thank you very much. Councillor Pawley. Uh, yes, I wanted to ask how many of these 600 houses are on um, um, housing association sites and um, what the situation is if uh, with the limited funding that might be available to all uh, public bodies at the moment, if they haven't got the money to do the work, what happens? Do they still get these fines? Um, both of these reports do not apply to social housing. Um, they have to commission their own. This is simply for the private rented sector that doesn't include social housing. Right. Um, coming back on that, um, we gave on Hearst Farm... I think it was about a year ago, we gave some money to help with cladding to um, on certain a number of privately owned properties. And, and we gave that donation of money because they were housing association properties that were all owned by elderly people. Um, but there were so, quite a few that we that, that couldn't have that work done because there was only a certain amount of money available. So um, if a person owns a a property and it's a privately owned property but not rented can they get funding from government to get that work done in other words there's somebody living in a house that's not that's got an f or g rating can't afford to do it themselves is there any funding available for those people perhaps if, if i could come in here chair um you're stealing rob coggins thunder there councillor paulie because you'll be coming with a report in the very near future about the second phase of, of, of work of that nature um, and um, giving some details on, on a recently announced funding initiative. There's £200 million being made available through something called the Local, Local Authority Delivery Mechanism um, for, uh, for green homes. Um, so Rob will be bringing a report about that in the next couple of weeks. Okay. And, and the answer to your question is yes, effectively, but I don't want to nick all his, his glory. Okay, thank you. Councillor O'Brien. Yeah, thank you, Joe. I wanted to make two points, if, if I could. Firstly, uh, I don't think, um, uh, Tim, you, you gave a full answer to Martin Burfoot's question. That's about resources. Um, and I, I see that the County Council has currently delegated responsibility, but not delegated uh, any funds to go with it. And while I see that you say in the report that the, this new responsibility is going to be absorbed into current workload, 
I mean, in reality, doesn't that mean that um, s some work, some existing work, isn't going to be carried out as effectively or as efficiently uh, as it is now? And I think I think we need to be honest and say, if we take on this additional responsibility, how, you know, however enthusiastic um, uh, you are, it, it is going to mean in reality that um, some of our existing enforcement is going to um, uh, is going to not be carried out as effectively as as we would like uh, and and secondly um, it's give me some concern this that you say that the enforcement is going to be carried out in accordance with the corporate guidelines that, that is that it's staged now uh, and it's a, it's a question for you as well chair um, I would have thought that when we're dealing with people in real fuel poverty and uh, families who are most vulnerable, shouldn't we really be enforcing this from, uh, from day one uh, rather than going through the stage procedure with uh, a landlord, which may take months and months, during which time the, the family can continue to live in, in fuel poverty and suffer while we're negotiating with the best intent. Isn't this an instance where we, we perhaps should review our enforcement to see if there are some instances where we should go straight to, uh, to taking full enforcement to protect vulnerable households? Tim. Thanks, Chair. I'll, I'll take this. I fear, Councillor O'Brien, you may have fallen into Councillor Flitter's trap and be deserving of a 25-minute answer, but I'll try not to be that bad. In relation to resources, uh, just so as you know, the, the, the team that deal with private sector housing enforcement are, are Laura and Matthew. So we've got two people who, as part of their jobs, deal with private sector housing enforcement. Uh, and they deal with that largely in a reactive manner. So if somebody phones up and says, um, I, I've got a problem with my rented property. Can you come and have a look at it? They'll go out and do a full inspection and deal with the, um, the enforcement issues that arise. And they do it very well. But that, that is the limit of resourcing that we've got. Um, this project that Laura is leading on is uh, additional to that and is some work that she's, uh, I won't say undertaken in a spare time because she doesn't have an awful lot of spare time, um, but, but it's been getting on with behind the scenes. It has taken some time to get ready and to some extent we were almost lucky there was a lockdown and we could borrow some resource off the licensing team to, to do the double checking that was required to get the whole thing moving. Um, now that it is moving, it will become a semi-automated process uh, and just involve the generation of letters and checking of replies. Um, from then on, it will be incorporated into the reactive um, service that we offer. Uh, as part of considering the, this housing stock condition survey that I talked about earlier, uh, we need to have a think about what we want for the future and what that means and what level of resourcing might be required to deliver it. And that will all form part of a report that will come uh, to, to committee in due course. It'll obviously have to be discussed corporately as well. Um, uh, it, it's not a big team, as, as um, both councillors have, have remarked, uh, and you know, we, we offer the service that we're able to offer at the moment. In terms of inf the enforcement policy, the corporate enforcement policy is on the website, uh, and uh, if you were to read it, um, you might notice that it's very similar to my style of writing, and that's because I wrote it uh, many, many years ago. It was the Environmental Health Enforcement Policy, which was then adopted as a corporate enforcement policy. Um, it does talk about a phased approach to enforcement, but we do recognise that, that you don't have to go through every single step of that in every single situation. Uh, to give an example that relates to the first report that, that I talked about, the one about um, civil penalties, um, if the team came across a, a vulnerable person who in the middle of winter was left without a boiler and no heating in the property, they wouldn't leave that and go through a whole system of letters and warnings and notices and everything else. They take emergency remedial action to get that boiler fitted as soon as it possibly could be um, because that will be appropriate in those circumstances. If we came across that problem in the middle of a heat wave in summer then we might go for the phased enforcement approach uh, and I use that example and Laura's smiling because she knows that has actually happened. Um, uh, so so we, we, do, we do try and judge each situation on its merits and take the appropriate enforcement action at, for that, those situations rather than going through every <coughs> single step every single time. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Well praised. <laughs> OK, Councillor Froggart. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, I'm happy to move the second part of this report. Um, it addresses many of the issues, not least to increase energy efficiency and reduce greenhouse gases, which is something that we've got can, to. Uh, Councillor, I can just stop you there. When you say the second part, are you talking about item 10? 
Item 10. Oh, we're just, we're just concentrating on nine at the moment. Right. Sorry, I, I um, thought because... Carry on. No, no, no we'll, we'll, we'll vote on them two on separately. Um, yeah, but, so but you wanted just, it moving. Uh, well, it's been moved, I think. The uh, item nine has been moved, I believe. Yeah, that has, but I'm not seconded. item 10. No, we, okay. we'll get on to that later. Okay. Sorry about the confusion, but I thought it would be good if Tim sort of did the two together because they are similar, but we will treat them separately uh, for a debate and, and uh, voting. So, did you want to add any more, Councillor Froggart? Okay. Uh, Councillor Gamble. Hi. Uh, just some questions, really. Just, I, I'm probably, this is probably my thick question, but it says tenancies from April 2018. Does that mean none of this will apply to anyone who's got a tenancy before 2018? And also, the bit later that said, uh, there'd be a maximum of £5,000 per incident. Um, I just wonder if you just clarify what incident means. I'm just thinking of it in terms of if somebody's contacted, they said that this hasn't happened and they don't do it. Is that one incident and no matter how many times they do it, is that one incident or will uh, uh, not complying with something, does that become incident too? I'm just trying to get an idea of how, how this sort of... Um, racks up uh, and then the other thing just out of interest the 600 properties i'm just i know very roughly but you know roughly how much that the rural urban split on that is so how many of those properties are in rural areas uh, that's it thank you If you don't mind, I, I can answer the, the last part of that question. The answer is no. I, I haven't looked at the data that closely to decide if there's a split and where those properties are within the district. No worries. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Councillor Buttle. All oh, right, yes. Um, about this enforcement and bringing it forward if people are in, uh, in, in, you know, in fuel poverty, the, the Germans um, charge the landlord for the heating bill for anybody who's vulnerable if their house doesn't meet the insulation standards. I don't think we can probably do that, but I'd like to. So there we go. Any comment on that, Tim? I tend to agree with Councillor Buffer on both points. I don't think we can do it, but it would be a good idea. OK, thanks. Uh, I've got no other speakers. Anybody else wants to add anything? Oh, sorry. Could I could I just have an, in, an answer about the um, what actually constitutes an incident? Just basically, the way it works is we can apply a number of fixed penalty notices to to each uh, to you know to one problem property. Uh, and what we're doing is instead of saying we we add them all together and it goes on ad infinitum, we cap that at five thousand pounds. That's about right, isn't it, Laura? Oh right. So, just, but I'm just, I'm just thinking in the scenario if somebody, you know, you catch what you you find them once and then they continue not to comply, would that become a new incident or would, does that carry on? Sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. If, if they continue not to comply, then then we might very well consider that the fixed penalty notice under this regime was an inadequate way of dealing with the issue, and we might go to. Um, uh, bear in mind that I said that excess coal could be one of the things that amounts to a housing hazard. We might go down the um, the more formal enforcement notice route, which we talked about in the first report, um, which could end up with the higher civil penalties or could end up with prosecution. So th th those things would all be weighed up. We tried to make the right enforcement choice at that time. Um, it, it is more complicated than these reports sometimes suggest. The situations in real life are, are often not entirely black and white, are they? Um, but, but the officers are quite experienced at dealing with them. And, 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 and although I say it myself, uh, I'm not talking about me. They are quite good at what they do. Thanks, Tim. I've no other speakers. Item nine has been moved. The recommendation has been moved and seconded. Uh, Jackie, can you do the vote, please? Yes, sir. Councillor Atkin? Paul. 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 Burfoot? Paul. Buttle? Paul. Donnelly? Paul. Roggett? Four. Vaness? Four. Gamble? Four. <clears throat> Hobson? Four. News? Four. Morley? Four. O'Brien? Four. Pawley? Four. Ratcliffe? Four. Sutton? 
Four. Wayne. Four. And Wakeman. Four. That's unanimous. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, move on to item 10 now. Um, the, I presume there's nothing else you want to add, Tim, on this one. Shall we go straight into debate? Um, Councillor Froggart. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, as, as, I, as I said before, um, this report addresses many issues, um, not least to increase energy efficiency and reduce greenhouse gases. And this is something that we have to uh, manage because we have a target, a climate emergency target, and we need to do this to meet that. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Sutton. Councillor Sutton, are you there? I would like to move this, and I think it's... Uh, uh, we're looking for a second, Councillor Sorry, Sutton. I'd like to second that. I, I do apologise. I'd love to apologise. Um, I'd like to second that. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Morley. Yes, I was simply going to second it, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Hughes. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, just a comment, really. Uh, I'm very pleased to, say, to, uh, to, to, to go with this uh, report, but I would say that it's uh, not a measure for increasing, uh, reducing carbon emissions. It's, nowhere, it's not sufficient for reducing carbon emissions. All it is doing is providing a very, very minimal standard of efficiency for housing, nowhere near enough to bring it up to a point that would meet a zero carbon house, housing requirement. To do that, you have to go to uh, A or A plus in terms of the EPC ratings. And we're talking about E, which is equivalent to a house with uh, six inches of roof insulation, double glazing, no wall insulation. So, uh, so uh, a standard stone built house in, in uh, the Derbyshire Dales with double glazing, efficient doors and six inches of roof insulation will give you a, a grade E. When, and your, the, the cost of heating that house will still be around six or seven hundred or a thousand pounds, depending on the size of house. This is not a, a means of reducing the, the uh, heat efficient, the uh, carbon footprint of housing. It's just a means of making heating a house affordable. Thanks. Councillor Burfoot. Councillor Burfoot. But uh, I will say, uh, I support this um, uh, recommendation in its entirety and, and particularly echo what Councillor Hughes just said about uh, energy performance certificates and the need to have um, fenestration double glazed, for instance. There are too many properties about that are single glazed uh, with poorly painted frames and so on, which not only reduce the energy performance of the buildings of the properties for the tenants, but obviously um, are, do, do detract from the street scene as well, particularly in an urban area. So I fully support uh, what has been said about that. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Gamble. Councillor Gamble. Sorry, I think my hand must have been just up by mistake. I hadn't put it up. <laughs> okay. Councillor Wayne. That must be ditto, because I, I didn't put it down from the last one. I thought you were doing that. Sorry, I've not got anything to say on this matter. OK. Councillor Pawley. Uh, yes, I just want you to know, because we're live here and, and the people might be listening who, who've got an interest in it, um, is there any way um, that a person who owns a private house, I was just thinking about a, a stone house with six inches of insulation in the roof and the double glazing still comes out at a knee, is there any way a member of the public can, can get their house um, assessed in, in any way? Thank you, Chair. I'll come in on this. Probably the best thing that, that member of the public could do is contact their energy company, who, who do have to put money into energy efficiency measures and may be able to help at the moment. Um, as I say, there has just been an announcement of um, about £200 million worth of funding nationally for local authority delivery, um, and, and Rob will report about on our thoughts about that in, in the next couple of weeks. Following that, we'll, there will be a, a further 300 million announced for delivery through the, the five regional energy hubs. Um, and we are 
intending with our colleagues in the Local Authorities Energy Partnership, which covers all the Nottinghamshire and all the Derbyshire authorities, we're intending to put a, a large scale bid together for the second round of funding um, to try and get some area wide energy efficiency works delivered through the local authorities to a common standard. Um, we've done that previously, and it's been very successful, and we'd like to think we get that in place again. Uh, so the discussion that was only announced at the beginning of August, um, and the discussions have only just started, but we'll come back with something on that in due course, Councillor Mrs. Pauley. Yeah, thank you, Tim. I've no other no members wishing to speak, it looks like. Um, so can we, we've been moved and seconded, can we go to the vote, please, Jackie? Councillor Atkin? Or. Bull? Or. Barefoot? Or. Battle? Or. Donnelly? Or. Froggart? Or. Ness? Or. Gamble? Or. Hobson? Or. Hughes? Or. Morley? Or. O'Brien? Or. Hawley? Or. Ratcliffe? Four. Sutton? Four. Wayne? Four. And Wakeman? Four. That's unanimous. Uh, thank you, Jackie. Uh, well, that concludes the meeting. That's the last item. Um, it's very nice to see that we've uh, been unanimous on, on every item. I can't remember when we did. We had that before. It must have been a long time ago. Um, well, that's very good. Very, very friendly meeting. And uh, thank you, members, and thank you for viewers for watching. Um, hope you found it interesting. Thanks very much. Thank you.